Solutions Forum. Welcome back. Uh, my guest in this segment is Mark Nikanen. How am I doing? Pretty good, Nikanen. Ni Mark Or as Nikanen. I often say, I've been called worse. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mark, and I have to read this because I have no memory, so even for four sentences it's got to be read. Mark is an organizer for Extinction Rebellion Vancouver Island and a four-time National Emmy Award winning investigative reporter out of the United States and author whose last three novels have focused on the climate uh, crisis. We're going to be talking about Extinction Rebellion and the climate emergency. Um, and Mark, uh, was it a couple of weeks ago now? Extinction Rebellion had a small event, actually it was quite large, uh, an event outside of the Times Colonist building. And That's right. We had organized a uh, protest outside there because of the fact that the uh, Times Colonist does not treat it as a climate crisis. And it's not hard when you start scratching a little bit into the ownership of that company to find out why. It's owned by Glacier Media which is a very ironic name for a Vancouver-based company that makes a lot of money pandering with periodicals and advice and consulting and data services to the oil patch. They put out the Daily Oil Bulletin, which in their annual report, their most recent one, they referred to as a flagship product in the single division in which the bulletin is published had revenues of $56 million last year, I guarantee you the Times Colonist is not pulling in those kind of dollars. So who's ruling whom in this case? It's clear that this corporation, Glacier Media, is, has a very strong control of that newspaper. Now the editor and publisher, Dave Obie, says, I don't take any orders from anybody. We're just on our own here. A couple of thoughts on this, Jack. The first is that self-censorship in the newspaper business, and actually in a lot of news organizations, is a very powerful thing. Does Dave, do you think Dave Obi, Obi would have a job if he assigned a reporter to look into, for instance, the $3.3 billion a year that we as taxpayers provide to the fossil fuel industry every single year. I've heard it's more like $60 billion. Well, you know what? That's a really interesting figure, and that comes from the International Monetary Fund. They look, that was a figure from 2015, which is, they isolated out. It's a really good number to bring up, because they were looking at all of the different flows that come in that are not necessarily accounted for. So that figure is solid, but even Canadian government auditors are honest about saying they can't track all the streams of money, taxpayer money, that goes in to these fossil fuel companies. So the IMF is pretty solid, but we're sure that at a very minimum, we're looking at a tremendous amount of billions of dollars every year. So if a reporter, or an editor in this case, were to say, let's take a look at where that money goes, it would be almost impossible that it's not going to the very oil companies and natural gas companies that are buying the services of the Times Colonists parent corporation. Yeah. I agree with you 100%. Um, it is Everybody knows, I mean, uh, really, no matter where you work, when you work, you do what the management expects of you. And I think that is completely true of everybody in the corporate media. If you want to work in the corporate media, you do what you know they want. And so, I mean, they never talk, I mean, there's a hundred issues they never talk about at the Times Colonist. And we shouldn't really be picking on the Times Colonist because all the corporate media is exactly the same. Well, here's my thinking, and you're right about that. It's pervasive, no question about it. And in many ways, they're emblematic. But the Times Colonist is our daily newspaper in our city, and we're not picking on them. We're singling them out because of what they do. That's the problem. They say, well, no, we cover the climate news, but they don't do 
enterprise reporting. And that's a term that I know you're familiar with, I'm familiar with, anybody who works in the business is familiar with it. It refers to doing being more than a stenographer for politicians and so forth, digging in a little bit. It's not investigative reporting, which can take months. It just means showing some initiative in the kind of reporting you do. And it was very interesting because Dave Obie, when he was asked about that after CFAX interviewed me, and I pointed that out, he offered a quote in which he said, I'm going to paraphrase, but unlike CFAX's hosts, I will be accurate. What he said was, we do a lot of enterprise reporting on things, and I would like to do more enterprise reporting on climate change, as he puts it, but I don't get to do, he didn't say I don't get to do, but I don't do, we don't do that on climate change and other topics. So he was grouping that in. I wish I had that quote directly in front of me, but that's the thrust of it. That was the whole crux of our protest. We're not saying you don't cover, um, for instance, subsidies to pipelines, which was in their business section today. Yeah, that's pretty routine. Your business reporter gets the news, makes some telephone calls and does it. But look at where that money is going. Do a little bit of digging. Show some initiative. Earn your stripes as a newspaper and as a journalist. To me, the fact of the matter is that everybody's life, and especially young people, everybody's life is in danger, not only because of the climate crisis that we're in, but because of the total environmental destruction of everything. And yet you can read the newspaper, listen to radio, listen to TV, and you would never get that impression. You'd never get that sense of urgency. The urgency. It's right. unbelievable. We're in the sixth great extinction. We're losing 200 species a week. Yeah. And it's as if, like you just said, we're all sitting around at tea time, yeah. taking it easy. Yeah. And that's what Extinction Rebellion, Vancouver Island, is, well, that's why we're in the streets. I mean. I'm going anywhere to speak at this point. I went to the school board the other night and spoke um, because they declared a national climate, they declared, excuse me, a climate emergency back in June. Well, they hadn't done anything, got any plans into effect and so forth. And so I spoke to them about the fact that this is urgent. Look, just last week, 11,000 scientists from around the world, these are peer reviewed folks, issued a statement saying that we will endure untold suffering if we don't move quickly to deal with the climate emergency. What else do we need to hear? Why isn't that in huge headlines? Why isn't that a banner? And that's what the media does. 11,000 scientists tell us our lives are in danger and we don't even hear about it. It's, it's, it, it, it's like the media, to the media, it couldn't be less important. The firing of uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs coach today will get a hundred times more coverage than that particular story. Well, and we saw that too, actually, when um, the wildfires devastated this province in uh, a year ago this past summer, where the birth of a royal baby completely dominated coverage at the same time that we were seeing wildfire smoke that will, in fact, damage the lungs of lots of babies and lots of children who had to breathe that. And that's another thing. There was a report that came out just this past week about the health of children in this climate crisis. I mean, this 2.5 micron size particles of wildfire smoke, that's about 1 60th the size of a hair, hair human hair. Um, they don't leave the lungs. They can pass right through the lungs and get into the bloodstream. There's research now over in Vancouver looking into what this neuroinflammation can do in the brain. Can it affect cognition? Can it affect emotions? This is really serious stuff. It's one thing if, you used, if we had wildfire seasons like when you and I were growing up, okay, they happen, they go, they pass. But this is chronic and just look at what's happening in California. Look what's happening in Australia, which we're not hearing about. That's right. Uh, and, and the tragedy of Venice. I mean, there's beautiful, beautiful old things that are just going to be destroyed. Well, that's interesting too, because the flooding of Venice happened to come out on the heels of a report from Climate Central, which took a look at sea level rise 
and found that it's actually in parts of the world, big parts of the world, affecting upwards of 300 million people, going to be three times higher by 2050 than expected. And that's because when the radar studies were done by the uh, Endeavour shuttle back in the year 2000, they weren't done very well in much of Asia because the radar was taking the height of buildings along coastlines and so forth. And that was factored into the average sea level rise. Benjamin Strauss, who was the lead scientist on the new study, managed to separate out the, those um, falsely elevated heights and just go with that. And what Climate Central reported in Nature Communications, if people want to look into it, was absolutely staggering. By 2050, South Vietnam won't exist. It's going to be flooded over. So will parts of Cambodia, Bangkok, goodbye Bangkok and a good part of Thailand. Same thing with Alexandria, Bangladesh, Mumbai, India. All Richmond, these places. Richmond, B.C. Pardon? Richmond, B.C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's more disproportionately impacting Asia in this case because they, uh, we tended in the northern hemisphere to have more accurate readings of our coastlines. Um, but that was still, I mean, this is staggering. That's 300 million people who could, where are they going to go? That's going to affect our lives. So what can we do? I mean, the media has betrayed us, I'd say, for the last 30 years because all of this has been well known for the last 30 years and the media has downplayed it, underplayed it, and ignored it. The media is now a threat to us because they won't tell us the truth about the danger we're in. They keep they keep focusing our, our anger and attention on other issues. We've got to do something about it. Uh, I don't know what we can do, but at least don't trust the media, don't believe the media. Recognize the media as an enemy of the people. I think it's really important to recognize that we have limited recourse, which is why we at Extinction Rebellion take to the streets. People get really ticked off because we close roads, yeah. we close bridges but people get talking. And if people have a better idea on how this thing can be approached, then let us know. Because most of us in Extinction Rebellion have tried everything. Yeah. Now, Extinction Rebellion is uh, basically a worldwide organization now. Mm -hmm. Started in, in England? In England, that's right. And I think we're in close to 70 countries now. Okay. So here we are. It's, uh, it's November of uh, 2019. I mean, at least here in, here in Victoria, we can certainly move to trains, away from cars. I mean, the trains are there. We have the track. We just need the provincial government, the John Horgan government, to do something. Um, what do you think about electric cars? Is that a way forward, or is that uh, something we can't afford anymore? Well, I think electric cars are great, um, but there's quite a carbon footprint to building an electric car. There is. That's, uh, and the other issue is we're really talking about what are healthy transportation choices. And clearly, in a hydropowered economy, electric vehicles are good. But do we really want to have electric vi vehicles in the same way we've had gasoline-powered vehicles clogging up the roads and so forth when mass transit would be much more effective? And I think what we need to do is start thinking in those terms and incentivizing people's choices because it is very expensive to own cars. It's very carbon intensive to build them. And so I'm not sure that electric cars, I mean, clearly they're better than gasoline powered cars. Absolutely. But I'm not sure that's really a great answer. I think we're looking at fairly fundamental changes to the way we need to live yes. and the way the economy has to function. I mean, we're launching into a holiday season now where basically we're going to be marinating in the uh, suggestions that we should buy more and more merchandise, that we should lather ourselves. I mean, it's almost like this consumerism has turned into this um, narcissistic self-adornment. And, and Mark, we're going to have to end it right there, but right. exactly that's the point. Yeah. We have to have less, and that's whether we want it or not, that's where we're going. Mark, thank you very much. Jack, thank you. It's really good to see you again. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.